Hello there. Welcome back to King's Crux. The last video we discussed about acute red eye through a mind map. I hope it was useful. So again, I'm going to give yet another common presenting complaint that is going to be defective vision. Defective vision is probably the most common presenting complaint you have in your practice and you know that. So I thought, why not give a system, why not give a complete mind map based teaching on defective vision? What I'm going to do is I'm going to take a bit forward, uh, kind of zoom out and even focus on the ocular symptoms as a whole. Then I'm going to zoom in to the defective vision. From there, we will talk about the sudden gradual onset of defective vision, painful and painless onset of defective vision, so on and so forth. Like the previous lecture, this is not going to be a comprehensive talk, but rather I'm going to give this bird's eye view or the eagle's eye view towards the entire complex concept called as defective vision. We'll take it one by one, step by step. So we'll start with the mind map. Again, you can download this mind map from the description box below. So once you got that mind map, put it on your phone or your tablet, and we will walk together. So in this lecture, I'm going to start with the central part of the map and expand it branch by branch so that it will make things much easier for you. So without any further delay, let's jump into the lecture. Thank you. So let's get started now. Now, defective vision is going to be a huge topic, all right? And uh, you can download the PDF from the description box below and you can watch this lecture by clicking on this link, which goes to this video what you're watching currently. Before even I'm gonna go into defective vision, I wanna focus on ocular symptoms first. So first I'm going to uh, condense all these branches together and then we'll take it step by step, all right? You can see here, the ocular symptoms can be either vision related or they can be non-vision related. Now we're gonna focus on vision related in this, but let's talk about non-vision related. So what are they? Any patient coming to you will either come with some problem in their vision or what they see, or they may come with pain, redness, watering. So the pain, redness, watering, all those things are gonna be a form of this, a part of this non-vision related. So pain, redness, discharge, watering, photophobia, headache, all these are going to be the non-vision related ophthalmic symptoms. Of these, the pain, redness, discharge, watering, photophobia, they all form a spectrum called as the acute red eye. Acute red eye is going to be a constellation of symptoms. They are another part of ophthalmic emergency and you can watch the acute red eye lecture by clicking on this link. You can download the mind map by clicking on this link. So this link is for the mind map and this link is for the video. All right. I'm also going to put the links of these two resources in the description box below. So you can click on them and download them. So once you know what the radar is, what is the other aspect of it is going to be the vision related. Again, vision related cannot be always straightforward. Sometimes you can have two ways to classify defective vision. One is going to be the proper defective vision or blurring of vision, like what I'm going to explain to you now. Uh, but what is more important to understand is going to be the disturbances in vision because the etiologies between these two vary. The causes vary. Okay? And sometimes patients come to you with a defective vision, which actually might be a disturbance in vision. So as a clinician, as an ophthalmologist, it is important for us to understand the differences between these two. Now, what are the disturbances in vision? It can be either a transient or a temporary loss of vision, a defective field of vision, or a distortion of vision or metamorphopsia, what do you call it? Some alteration or, or, for example, a straight line appearing curved, especially you can see in macular pathology. So it's a distortion of vision. A double vision or seeing two images, diplopia. A color vision deficiency. Seeing colored halos on seeing a white light, you see the rainbow colors, flashes and floaters. Now, this topic, this lecture is not going to be focusing on these because these are by themselves entire lectures. So I'm not going to focus much on these, but I'm going to focus on the defective vision. Okay. So defective vision can be either sudden or gradual. Okay. So the sudden onset defective vision is going to be our emergency. Any patient coming to you with a sudden onset defective vision is an ophthalmic emergency. It is similar to a patient coming with an acute red eye. 
A sudden onset defect division can be either painful or it can be painless. Painful again can be with red eye, without red eye. On the contrary, painless defectivation will be unilateral or bilateral. Now, this classification of sudden onset defective vision is much more practical, much more useful, and it's easy to understand, easy to remember. Okay. On the contrary, gradual defective vision can be again painful and painless. The painless defective vision is going to be what we commonly see, for example, a cataract or a refractive error. So depending upon which age they are being affected. So I am going to classify back into patients with less than 40 years of age or more than 40 years of age. Clear. So now we have, I've given you a brief summary of the various aspects of defective vision. Now we'll take one by one in detail. We'll explain, I'll try to explain each condition in a very brief way. I'm not, I'm not going to explain everything in a comprehensive way because this is not the lecture for that. This is going to give you a more of a bird's eye view into this big spectrum called defective vision. So let's jump into defective vision proper. Now, like I said, defective vision can be either sudden defective vision or there can be a gradual defective vision. DV stands for defective vision. I'll focus on the gradual later because gradual is less important. What is more important is going to be sudden onset defective vision. The sudden onset can be again classified into painful or painless. Okay. The painful again can be classified into with red eye and without red eye. Now, what are the painful conditions of defective vision presenting with red eye? Very easy. All the constellation of conditions which is going to cause acute red eye with defective vision. So like I said, you can watch the acute red eye lecture and you can download the acute red eye mind map to have more information on these conditions. Okay, just I'm going to give you very basic uh, key points to remember for each. So what are the conditions which are going to cause a sudden defective vision, which is painful with red eye, acute angle closure glaucoma, acute anterior veitis, acute keratitis, acute endophthalmitis and trauma or injuries, which again can be classified into a mechanical trauma or can be a chemical trauma. All right. Now, what are the points for acute angle closure glaucoma? Pain, vomiting, colored halos. Apart from the acute red eye with defective vision, the patient will have pain, severe pain, vomiting, very key important symptom. Presence of colored halos because of the corneal edema corneal edema, the shallow anterior chamber depth, a mid-dilated pupil, and more importantly, an increased intraocular pressure, which is causing all these problems. Acute antiruviatus, pain with glare, with history of recurrence and history of systemic association. These two are very important. Recurrence, systemic association. Presence of keratic precipitates or these multiple deposits of inflammatory cells on the endothelium or on the back of cornea. AC reaction, presence of anterior chamber inflammatory cells and flares, nothing but a protein leak, which is going to form the AC reaction. Intense AC reaction can cause the so-called fibrinous membrane, which sometimes can be associated with Another important finding that is hyperpion or pus in anterior chamber. It's so going to be a sterile inflammatory uh, exudates, which is settling down on the anterior chamber, giving this appearance of a hypopion, but not exactly it's a pus. It's mostly an inflammatory accumulation, which you commonly see in Bechet's disease or HLA B27 associated anterior uveitis. Posterior sinicae, where the iris goes back and adhere to the uh, anterior lens capsule, there's going to be the posterior sinicae which later gives this appearance of a festooned pupil or a flower-shaped pupil. Acute keratitis, very important, is going to be presence of pain, glare, always ask for history of contact lens wear or trauma. You will see a corneal ulcer or a corneal infiltrate with or without hyperpion. And here hyperpion will be infective or you can even isolate some organisms from the hyperpion. On similar lines is going to be the acute endophthalmitis, which is again is going to be an infective condition. The patient is going to have a pain and preceding floaters. The initial floaters can later become a defective vision altogether. Very important is you have to always ask history of any cataract surgery, history of intravitreal injections, any intraocular procedures, presence of long-standing intravenous lines, sepsis, or trauma. How the patients have? The patients will have 
the corneal edema, they will have hyperpion, very important feature, and patients will have a tritus because endophthalmitis is nothing but inflammation of the inner coats of the eye. Okay. That's going to be with the uh, conditions. Now let's go for the trauma. The trauma is going to be mechanical trauma or chemical trauma. Mechanical trauma can again be uh, either you can classify into a closed globe injury or an open globe injury. The classification is given by this Birmingham eye trauma terminology system, which is very important. The closed globe injuries are going to be contusion or a lamellar laceration. The open globe injuries are going to be laceration and rupture. Now, I'm not going to give much details on these things because this is going to be an entire lecture on itself, but it is good to know this classification when you're practicing in your accident emergency clinic. So always classify whether it's an open globe injury, whether it's, that, whether it's a breach of uh, ocular uh, surface, there's a breach of ocular integrity, that's open globe. A closed globe is there is no breach. The ocular surface remains intact. Contusion and rupture are both going to be caused by a blunt trauma. So you can have a trauma, a mechanical injury, which can be either because of, of a blunt object like a fist or can be a sharp object which can penetrate. All right. The chemical or alkali burns are going to be another important cause of a sudden onset defective vision presenting with an acute red eye. So always know the alkali are going to be more destructive than acid. So what are the signs you will see in these chemical burns? Uh, please be aware of the white eye. Not always these patients will have an acute red eye. Sometimes presence of this white eye is much more ominous. It's much more dangerous because a white eye can indicate ischemia. Okay, there can be this perilimbal blanching of vessels, blanching of conjunctival vessels because of the intense chemical burns. So that ischemic appearance is something which you have to be very much cautious about. Look for any lid burns, look for any retained alkali or lime in the furnaces, conjunctival chemosis, conjunctival ulceration, scarring can happen as a late sequelae. Uh, presence of corneal edema, epitheliopathy, in advanced cases, the patients can present stromal necrosis as well. Also look for AC reaction. Now, these are conditions which are going to have a defective vision, just sudden onset, presenting with pain. Okay. And they're going to have acute red eye. So far clear? Now, let's talk about defective vision, which is sudden in onset, all right, which is going to be painful, but without red eye. Without red eye. So what are the conditions which are going to cause without red eye? There's only one important condition which you have to know. When it comes to a sudden onset, painful defective vision, okay, with no red eye at all, that is going to be optic neuritis. Very, very important. Optic neuritis. Please don't forget this. Optic neuritis is very important because uh, it mostly affects young females. Any young female presenting with a unilateral sudden onset painful defective vision, please think of optic neuritis. Optic neuritis, there are multiple variants. There are multiple types of optic neuritis. What we commonly encounter is going to be this retrobulbar neuritis, which means that uh, if it's going to be the eyeball, so, so it's going to be the eyeball. So whatever inflammation is going to have before or, or beyond the eyeball is going to be this retrobulbar optic neuritis, which is involved in the optic nerve. So in these patients, they're going to have this pain on extraocular movements. Only when the eyeball moves, the patients will have pain. And that's to do with the anatomy. That's to do with the, uh, the annulus of Zinn or the common tendinous ring of Zinn, which gives the origin to the extraocular muscles. So what happens at, the, at, at that area of the Zinn's ring, um, you have this strong adherence or addition to the optic nerve as well, to, okay, to the covering of the optic nerve. So when the eyeball moves, the inflamed optic nerve is going to get affected. Therefore, the patient is going to have pain on extraocular movements. The second is going to be the red desaturation test. It's a very sensitive indicator for optic neuritis. The patient will have this washed out appearance of red. So if you're going to show a patient with a red colored pen, the patient will not perceive red as it should be. Rather, he will see a washed out or a dull or faded out appearance of the red color or the coloration deficiency also will be reduced for the patient. Look for relative afferent pupillary defect in these patients because an RAPD indicates uh, the optic nerve is going to be involved and you will see RAPD when you have a unilateral presentation or an asymmetric presentation. In any condition which is going to cause a bilateral problem, the patient will not have RAPD. Please remember that. You will see RAPD only when one of the eye is affected or when one of the eye is affected more than the other. 
So retrobulbar means the problem is beyond the bulb, beyond the eyeball, to be more precise, beyond the optic disc. So you, most often these patients will have a normal optic disc. That's a very key feature of this optic neuritis. The patient will not see anything and you, the clinician also will not see anything because discs appear normal, okay? So a normal disc is what you will see in a retrobulbar neuritis. But sometimes patients can have inflammation of the optic disc itself in optic neuritis. That's what we call as a papillitis, okay? What is the key concept to understand is that the most common cause of this optic neuritis is going to be multiple sclerosis. So it is important for us to understand and, uh, and kind of find this condition and make sure the patients are getting neuroimaged because that can involve the brain in the form of a demyelinating lesions in the cortex. Okay. Now this is going to be uh, the optic neuritis. Now let's go for more common sudden defective vision. Okay, which is painless. Clear? Which is painless. So the sudden onset defective vision, painless defective vision is going to be either unilateral or bilateral. So what are the unilateral causes of a sudden onset painless defective vision? What are the causes for a bilateral sudden onset painless vision? Think for a moment. Now, when do you experience a painless defective vision, just sudden and onset, when you have ischemia? Just remember that when you either have an ischemia, when there is less blood or when you have a hemorrhage, when you have a more blood, so a less blood or more blood, this is the way you can easily understand. You can easily remember these conditions. Okay. So what are the conditions which are going to cause a painless unilateral defective vision, ischemic or pale areas on fundus, blood spots or more blood on the fundus, raised areas. For example, retinal detachment, which is the raised area. And as always, trauma. See, trauma will feature in every aspect of it. Okay, Trauma can be there with a red eye, with pain. Trauma can also cause painless sudden onset defective vision as well. So please be aware of trauma because trauma is going to be a common denominator in many of these conditions. And trauma is highly variable. And depending upon the trauma, whether it's a trivial trauma or a significant trauma, the patients will have other symptoms as well. All right. So these are the four conditions or the, these, these are four ways to classify a unilateral painless sudden onset defective vision. Okay. How do you classify a bilateral? Bilateral can be either cortical blindness. Toxic optic neuropathy, grade 4 hypertensive retinopathy. I'm just going to give both these things together because you have to understand a patient presenting with a bilateral sudden onset defective vision okay, is very unique and very rare. Not many conditions present with the sudden onset bilateral presentation. And which means that you're dealing with something more dangerous whenever both things are going to be involved simultaneously. Okay. So just want to spend a minute or two on this bilateral aspect because this is more important than the unilateral ones. Cortical blindness is, is a term which clinicians use to describe the sudden onset defective vision because of a bilateral occipital lobe infarct. And again, similar to optic neuritis, these patients will have normal fundus. So always suspect a cortical blindness, especially in old age patients who is going to have presence of hypertension, or any cardiovascular risk factors or history of stroke in the past, they can be more prone for having this occipital lobe infarct, which can again lead on to this sudden onset, bilateral, painless, defective vision. Toxic optic neuropathy, another classic example of methyl alcohol poisoning, where in India and other uh, developing countries, this, this illicit or, or illegal liquor can lead on to this sudden onset bilateral defective vision. Okay. And later the patients will often end up with an irreversible loss of vision. The patients will have a pale disc, as you can see in this picture or optic atrophy, what you call. But initially, again, the patients may have a normal fundus or normal disc as well. But in this condition, the patients will not have a normal fundus. The patients will have abnormalities on their retina. That's why it is Easy to pick up, but it is much more important to us. There is grade four hypertensive retinopathy or what you call as a malignant hypertension. Okay. The key feature is that when it comes to this malignant hypertension, it is important to understand the patient will have very high blood pressure. It's almost like more than 220 to 120, what you call as an accelerated hypertension. 
presence of malignant hypertension or presence of this grade four hypertensive retinopathy indicates that the patient is going to have an end organ damage. Okay, that is the key feature. You see this grade four hypertensive retinopathy, which means the patient's other organs would have been affected as well, especially brain in the form of stroke, the heart in the form of MI and renal disease. MI means myocardial infarction. So always look for these other symptoms, or these are the signs of endocrine damage as well. The patient will have a very severe headache, blurring of vision, which is bilateral, sudden onset, okay? On fundus examination, you will see bilateral disc edema with flame-shaped hemorrhages, heart exudates, and cotton wool spots. Most often, this will appear or, or mimic like a diabetic retinopathy, okay? But look for these bilateral disc edemas, which are very, very important, okay? Again, uh, some patients in severe conditions, they can have choroidal disease as well. You will have this choroidal infarcts, what you call as uh, the, the two types, the focal infarct, what you call as elginic spots, and the streaks or linear infarcts, what you call Seagrist streaks. Just know them. Okay, This is for, for residents, basically. These patients can present with serious or exudative retinal detachment as well because of increase in blood pressure. Increase in the uh, increase in the uh, arterial hypertension can again can cause all the fluid to leak out, forming the serious or exudative retinal detachment. So now we have discussed about this grade four hypertensive retinopathy, which is very important because you see any patient presenting with bilateral disc edema, and you see this kind of a picture. Always take blood pressure because it will be us who would be detecting this condition first, then the physicians. And this requires urgent care from a physician's perspective. So we discussed about the bilateral conditions of painless defective, sudden onset defective vision. Now let's go for a much more common, there's gonna be unilateral, sudden onset, painless defective vision. Most often these patients are gonna be having these four things. Like I said, a pale area or ischemic area, blood spots, raised area trauma so what are the ischemic areas what are the pale areas so whenever you see something pale what can be the pale can involve on the retina the pale can be on the optic disc but understand most often optic disc in acute or in acute incident a sudden sudden incident happening on the optic disc will most often present as a swelling only later it becomes pale or later it becomes atrophic but sometimes you can find the paler with the swelling together. That's what happens in this anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, okay? Anterior ischemic optic neuropathy can be either a non-arthritic or N-A-A-I-O-N or an arthritic A-A-I-O-N. What do you mean by non-arthritic? Which means there is no uh, arthritis, there is no inflammation of the arteries itself. But here you have an ischemia. These patients often present with a defective vision on waking up. One fine day when they wake up in the morning, they will find themselves losing their vision on one of their eyes, which is painless. You look at the fundus, the patients will have a disc edema with a small cup, which means uh, the patient's central paler, the, the, the central cup will be very less, sometimes even obliterated. And this patient will have more of hyperemia, more of redness when compared to paler. This is important when we'll discuss with the arthritic. The patient will have an altitudinal field defect, which means one half of their field is, is gone. So again, this is where the margins are blurred between a defective field of vision and defective vision. Patients can often confuse both. And a patient with NAAON will have defective vision, and they may also have an altitudinal field defect as well. That's why it's important to do visual fields on these patients. Systemic association like hypertension, sleep apnea, Intake of uh, sildenafil or, or Viagra can again be important risk factors for this condition called as NAAION. The key feature is that these patients will have a normal erythrocyte sedimentation rate, which means the inflammatory markers are well under control. Because this is more of ischemia than of an inflammation. Okay. So one feature to understand is that I said about the disc edema with a small cup. So always look for the other eye as well. In the other eye, the patients may have a small disc. They will have a crowded disc or small cup disc ratio. What you call is a disc at risk. So you see one eye NAAION, you see the other eye and look for any small CDR, a small cup disc ratio. Clear? Now this is gonna be uh, the, the first type of AION, just non-arthritic AION. Now let's talk about a much more important 
a more serious emergence this is going to be arthritic aion so in arthritic aion the patient will have this the classic pallid disc edema where you will have a disc edema and also it's going to be pale as well so both will be there together this is a pallid disc edema what is the important systemic association of remember is going to be jain cell arthritis jain cell arthritis is going to be an ophthalmic emergency it's very important for us to pick up this condition as early as possible because of one important reason that this can lead to the second eye developing irreversible loss of vision very soon the key clinical features of a jain cell arthritis are going to be a presence of a temporal headache scalp tenderness and pulsating temporal artery which which is very important to identify in these patients and apart from that the other clinical features going to be jaw claudication and polymyalgia rheumatica or or these stiff joints stiff painful joints an important differentiating feature between the non arthritic and the arthritic aion is going to be this presence of raised esr as you might remember you have a normal esr in a non arthritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy but in case of an arthritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy the patients will have a raised esr so please remember that jain cell arthritis is an ophthalmic emergency and as practitioners especially in developed countries it is important for the students for the practitioners to be aware of gca okay so we finished with the anterior ischemic optic neuropathy we discussed about the non arthritic and we discussed about the arthritic types of aion now let's look at the other pale areas on the fundus now we look at the pale areas on the retina there are going to be two a central retinal artery occlusion and branch retinal artery occlusion so crao is going to be a condition where the entire retina or at least the fundus part of retina the posterior pole of the retina becomes pale they become pale which means they become white they become swollen or or edematous retina you will see a cherry red spot at the fovea so what is this cherry red spot you will see this central dark pigmentation now you see that central dark pigmentation because of the pale retina the retina becomes pale so the underlying choroid will will have a better visibility as you all know that the fovea is going to be the thinnest layer of the retina so the underlying choroid is seen very clearly or seen more prominently which appears as this cherry red spot so you should know the other differential diagnosis for cherry red spot which is important you have to know these list crao berlin's edema or commotio retinae which we discussed in the acute red eye lecture presence of sphingolipidosis or any storage disorders cuneate toxicity ocular ischemic syndrome which is very important cause for a, a sudden onset defective vision they can have pain or they may not have pain depending upon the involvement of ac reaction and presence of uh, neovascular glaucoma associated or not now this is this might be a tad on the higher level for common uh, practitioners out there so just reserve it for some time later a macular hole with the surrounding retinal detachment can be another important cause for a cherry red spot so know these differential features of cherry red spot now coming back we saw that cherry red spot is one of the important features clinical features of crao crao patients why crao occurs is because of presence of emboli right presence of uh, some thromboembolic phenomenon it can be anywhere it can be it can be here on the carotid artery so a part of the thrombus gets detached becomes an emboli and goes and blocks your central retinal artery or other branch of central retinal artery so you will see an emboli or you may not see an emboli but once there's going to be a block the blood in the artery you know, are not going to flow properly so the sluggish blood flow or this called as box carrying or the cattle tracking of the vessels you will see this multiple bits and pieces like a skip lesions you will see the blood at at different levels or different regions here the patient will have an arterial attenuation as well not just optic nerve pathologies even retinal pathologies such as crao or a massive retinal detachment can also present as a relative afferent pupillary defect so please be aware of that and what are systemic associations of crao so something similar to your uh, aion always consider gca always look for jain cell arthritis in elderly patients because a patient with gca can also present with crao please be aware of that 
and also the cardiovascular risk factors. Patients who present with a non-arteritic form of AAON can also present with CRAO as well because ischemia is ischemia. No matter if it affects the optic nerve or the retina, it's going to be the same. So look for systemic associations in CRAO. Okay. What is BRAO? BRAO means only a branch is being affected. Only one particular area is being affected. That's called it's a branch retinal artery occlusion. Sometimes they may not involve macula. When they are going to be a macular sparing, the patient will not have any defective vision. They just have a defective field of vision. Okay. But here, when you have a macula getting involved, the patient will have a problem there. So most they will have a field defect and defective vision only if the macula is involved. You'll have a sectoral pallor of retina and the risk factors are similar to a CRAO. Now that's with the BRAO or branch retinal artery occlusion. Now let's come to the blood spots on the fundus. So what are the blood spots? You, will, you can see hemorrhages on, on the fundus. So we're talking about unilateral condition. We saw the bilateral hemorrhages and heart exudate disc edema in malignant hypertension. Now let's see what are the conditions which causes unilateral presentation. First and foremost is going to be retinal vein occlusion to be more specific, the central retinal vein occlusion is a very important condition which causes the sudden onset, unilateral, painless, defective vision. So always remember CRAO and CRVO are going to be very important differentials to have in mind. Disc edema. The patient may or may not have disc edema. The patient will have this tortuous blood vessels. You can see in this picture, you have a tortuous blood vessels and you will see hemorrhages in all four quadrants. What do you call it? A typical tomato splash appearance. As you can see in this picture, you can see the entire retina is filled with hemorrhages in all four quadrants, superior, inferior, nasal, as well as temporal. So you see these hemorrhages everywhere. You will see tortuous blood vessels and you will see a macular edema. Now this is going to be healthy macula. This is the normal dip is to be expected. You have a macular edema. The patient is going to have this elevation or accumulation of fluid is going to be there at the macula, to be more precise, at the fovea. Okay. So macular edema is going to be a very important cause of defective vision in this patient. What are types of CRVO? Why this is important is because a patient having CRVO can often present as an ischemic CRVO or a non-ischemic CRVO. Ischemic means the patient will have more defective vision. The patient will have an RAPD similar to CRAO. The risk of neovascular glaucoma is going to be there. Very important. You call it as a 90-day glaucoma. And presence of neovascular glaucoma that can happen in CRVO, that can happen in CRAO, that can happen in ocular ischemic syndrome, no matter which uh, disease, NVG is going to happen. Presence of NVG itself can cause pain. That can cause AC reaction. That can cause significant pain. So that becomes like an acute red eye there. Okay. So always look for new vessels, new vessels on the disc, new vessels on the iris, and new vessels elsewhere on the retina. Okay. Non-ischemic is going to be where the patients will not have uh, NVG, but most often they are present with just sudden onset pain as defective vision. They will have a macular edema. So with that, we finish off the CRVO. Now let's go for the BRVO. So like BRAO or branch retinal artery occlusion, these patients will have a defective field of vision. But when macula is going to get involved, you will have, the patients will have a defective vision. So always look for this sectoral distribution of hemorrhages. In BRAO, you have a sectoral pallor. You can see the sectoral pallor here. Whereas in case of a BRVO, you have a sectoral hemorrhage here. There is branch retinal vein occlusion. So look for field effects. Patients may have metamorphopsia or what you call it, distortion of vision. So again, linking back to our initial thing, this, these are going to be so-called the defective, uh, I mean the disturbances in vision rather than the defective vision itself. But patients can present with both. That's why it's important to know these conditions as well. Uh, know these types of disturbances in vision as well. HRVO or hemi-retinal vein occlusion is going to be a variant of this where the, uh, the entire, either the entire inferior or the superior quadrants of the retina will be having this vein occlusion. So this is an inferior HRV or hemi-retinal vein occlusion. Now, coming to yet another spectrum of conditions, which is causing the bloody areas on the fundus, is going to be a vitreous hemorrhage. Vitreous hemorrhage is going to be more common than your HRVO uh, and other conditions because there are multiple conditions which can cause a vitreous hemorrhage. Okay, Vitreous hemorrhage is, is not a disease. It's not a diagnosis per se. It's rather a sign. Okay, 
the patient see in this picture i i see you can see the see the blood oozing into the vitreous but most often you will not see anything at all you will see complete haziness you will see this uh, a, a very hazy media often present as a dark red or a black reflex on slit lamp or a direct ophthalmoscope the patients will often have an initial onset of floaters the floaters kind of becoming a big black screen in front of their eyes always look for signs of a proliferative diabetic retinopathy even if you don't find it on that affected eye always look for the other eye look for the other uh, look for the signs or look for the causes of this vitreous hemorrhage and that you will find it better when you look at the other eye so always examine the other eye and also assess the cardiac risk factors any bleeding disorders or if the patient is going to have any anticoagulants taken so these things can again can can exaggerate can exacerbate vitreous hemorrhage on similar lines is going to be the presence of this pre retinal hemorrhage where retina is going to be there kind of trapped kind of trapped between the vitreous and on the retina so it will be on the retina actually so a prh on the macula can be a very important cause of a sudden onset defective vision and again you should look for signs of proliferative diabetic retinopathy very important wet armd or presence of a choroidal neovascular membrane okay can again lead on to bleeding see wet armd is a very important condition especially in developed countries where patients can present this sudden onset defective vision but they can have distortion of vision which is metamorphopsia they can have a central scrotum or a central field defect because macula is getting involved so anything affects the macula can present with either a distortion of vision or a central scrotum okay but in these patients with wet armd they will have a subretinal or a sub rpe hemorrhage or exudates which means that you have this choroidal neovascular membrane a, a neovascular mass a neovascular lesion developing from the choroid which causes bleed to be settled in the subretinal space so always look for a presence of drusen in the same eye which means the patient has has gone for transformation from the dry armd into a wet armd okay or you can also look for drusen on the other eye as well we looked at the bloody areas and these are various causes you saw the retinal vein occlusion you saw the vitreous hemorrhage the pre retinal hemorrhage the wet armd now let's go for the raised areas so raised areas means the retina is raised the more common cause of this raised lesion is going to be a macula involving regmatogenous retinal detachment and it's a big word which means see i, I said any lesion involving the macula will have a defective vision that's important what is regmatogenous presence of a break regma means a break a retinal tear that causes vitreous to go inside and the retina gets lifted up that's called rrd right now look at this in these patients okay they often present with this preceding floaters or flashes especially in myopic eyes when you see a high myopia patient with with high minus power complaining of floaters or flashes then leading on to defective vision think of retinal detachment and you will see this gray reflex or very dull reflex on slit lamp ophthalmoscope when you have a total retinal detachment so the retina is getting detached so all this uh, rp pigments are going to have they're going to come in the anterior vitreous phase so you will see pigments in the anterior vitreous phase what he call as the the shaffer's sign a very important sign to look for in rd so these patients will have this raised or detached retina which often kind of flutters okay and please please look for hunt for presence of these breaks retinal det detachment is going to be an emergency the presence of an rrd is going to be a very important emergency it's a surgical emergency it's not a medical but rather it's a surgical emergency which means the patient needs to undergo a repair or reattachment of retina by vitreoretinal surgeon as early as possible to give a better post operative visual outcome please understand that compared to your <clears throat> defective vision in a regmatogenous rd the defective vision and tractional rd which happens in pdr or proliferative diabetic retinopathy this tends to be more of gradual than sudden so most often we make the mistake of calling this tractional rd as sudden onset but they tend to be more of gradual than sudden because attraction takes quite long time to develop a macular attraction can cause can be of chronic of course and that can lead to a gradual painless defective vision on the contrary a sudden onset painless defective vision which is unilateral you often see it in this regmatogenous retinal detachment another 
important condition which, which is again a raised area which means you have a fluid collecting beneath the retina or in the sub retinal space uh, that's going to be the CSCR a central serous coded retinopathy again these patients don't always complain of defective vision but they will give a complaint of a defective field which is central field so central scotoma so please remember these six s's in case of CSCR scotoma which is central scotoma sex male sex stress steroid intake exogenous steroid intake smoking and presence of a subretinal fluid and OCT all these features are going to be typical or characteristic of CSCR or central serous chorioretinopathy so now we have finished uh, the presence of ischemic areas or pale areas we saw the bloody areas on the fundus blood spots then we looked at the raised areas on retina now we go for the trauma trauma is again a highly variable okay now here i'm talking about a painless trauma which means sometimes patients can just rub their eyes they will find themselves with a sudden onset defective vision what happens is that sometimes when they, when they rub their eyes or any trivial trauma in an already weak eye which means weak lens sometimes the lens can dislocate what it calls a traumatic dislocation of lens and these patients can present with effecia means you will not see lens because the lens might have fallen on the retina so you can see in this picture there's a lens drop into the vitreous so you can see the lens the crystalline lens on the retina if the patient would have had an intraocular lens implanted previously again that can get dislocated then that can again fall on the retina and this eye will drop into the vitreous as well now that's with the traumatic dislocation of lens but there's one important area which i want to focus is going to be traumatic optic neuropathy a traumatic optic neuropathy again the patient may have pain depending upon the trauma cannot say it's going to be complete painless the patient may have pain and it is important to understand uh, important to uh, rule out traumatic optic neuropathy in any trauma patients because a patient with a traumatic optic neuropathy means the optic nerve is damaged and once optic nerve is damaged everything is gone no matter how much how well you repair your anterior segment no matter what lens you're going to place because of a traumatic dislocation if the optic nerve is gone it's gone the most common cause of a traumatic optic neuropathy is because of a compression of a broken optic canal on the optic nerve there are different mechanisms but this is what the more important one is RAPD relative afferent pupillary defect is another important thing which you have to find in an asymmetric or when one eye is involved with the traumatic optic neuropathy so always check for perception of light so presence of perception of light which means you you throw light at the patient and the patient has sense light which means it indicates a good visual prognosis it indicates the optic nerve is intact but when there's no pl when there's no perception of light which indicates that there is a nil visual prognosis no matter how much ever you treat you cannot bring back the vision for the patient it's a very important concept to understand especially in any traumatic optic neuropathies a medical legally important so far we have covered the important causes of sudden onset defective vision which is painless okay we discussed about uh, both the unilateral as well as bilateral areas okay so bilateral we discussed about the important cortical blindness toxic optic neuropathy and malign hypertension in unilateral we discussed about the pale areas the bloody areas the raised areas and then we discussed about important trauma it's a traumatic dislocation of lens as well as traumatic optic neuropathy i hope that makes sense okay i hope i've i've cleared i've, I've covered the bad essentials of a very important area that is going to be a sudden onset defective vision because a sudden onset defective vision is going to be a very important uh, emergency which you will come across in your daily practice so you have so much to uncover when you, when a patient is present with a sudden defective vision now let's look at a much more common but not an emergency but you have to know about what are the causes for a gradual defective vision because not every day a patient will come with a sudden onset defective vision in a routine practice a patient will come with a long standing defective vision what you call as a gradual defective vision so again that can be either painful they can be painless a painful cause of gradual defective vision just for example purpose just for exam why was sake chronic uveitis and chronic corneal ulcers on the contrary what is more common is going to be presence of this gradual painless defective vision again you classify into more than 40 years less than 40 years more than 40 years means mm, very commonly cataract is going to be the most common cause 
presence of a cataract is going to be the most common cause of, of a defective vision, which is gradually increasing. Uh, presbyopia, above 40 years of age. A progressive pterygium, a pterygium kind of in a central visual axis. Dry ARMD, which is very important because look always present of this drusen. So look for drusen at the macula in dry ARMD. Sometimes this can become sudden in case of a wet ARMD when the dry becomes wet. Always look for signs of diabetic retinopathy. The most common cause of defective vision in a patient with diabetic retinopathy is going to be presence of a diabetic macular edema. Very important. Like I said, uh, a diabetic retinopathy can become proliferative or you have these new vessels forming, causing tractional bands and tractional retinal detachment. In this tractionality, it's going to be more of gradual than sudden. You will see sudden in case of a regmatogenous RD, but not in tractionality. Primary open angle glaucoma, another very important cause of chronic vision loss in advanced POAG. See, most often glaucoma patients will not have defective vision. They will have a defective field of vision. Most often goes undetected. Okay. But in advanced stages, the patients can have cross defective vision, especially when it goes for this glaucomatous optic atrophy or pale of optic disc. So before that, the patient will have this increased cup disc ratio, what called glaucomatous cupping. There is a neuroretinal rim is being lost. So speaking of atrophy, optic atrophy is a very important cause of a long-standing defective vision. So always look for disc paler. The optic atrophy should always look for the cause. What are the cause of optic atrophy? Is it a primary optic atrophy? Is it a secondary optic atrophy? Is it a consecutive optic atrophy? Or is it going to be a glaucomatous optic atrophy? Okay, there are different varieties, different types of that, which we won't discuss here for now. But please understand, you see a disc pallor, look for the cause. Okay. Even you see a disc pallor, you think of something neurological. The patients can have a long-standing space occupying lesion, which is going to cause optic atrophy. So always be aware of optic atrophy, which you should not uh, dismiss it just like a nutritional pallor. You can have something more serious inside the brain as well. Less than 40 years of age. The most common is going to be refractive error. The patient can either have a myopia, patient can have a hypermetropia or an astigmatism. Presence of dry disease can again cause accumulation of debris. You know, the dryness of or the corneal surface can lead on to this blurring of vision. So always look for dry disease. Keratoconus, an important cause of defective vision in patients or high astigmatism in patients less than 40 years of age. Corneal dystrophy, okay. Cataract, not always cataract is age related. Sometimes patients can have a developmental cataract. Sometimes they can have a complicated cataract. When, when the patient is going to use steroids, there's going to be uveitis. The patients can use complicated PSCC. A juvenile glaucoma or congenital glaucomas. Retinitis pigmentosa. We talked about corneal dystrophies. Even retinal dystrophies can cause this younger onset defective vision. So in retinitis pigmentosa, it is important to look for these things. Always look for a defective night vision or nyctalopia. Tunnel vision. One other condition where you have a tunnel vision is going to be your advanced glaucoma. Look for these three important signs. Look for a dispeller optic atrophy, bony spicules, and attenuated arterioles. So these three are going to be important uh, signs you should look for in case of retinitis pigmentosa. Family is very important to ask these patients as well. Hereditary macular dystrophy, especially in case of Stargardt's disease, the patient can again present with a defective vision from the younger age group. Macular scar. Yet another cause. So look at this. Any involvement of macula can lead on to this defective vision, just long-standing. Uh, in case of a toxoplasmosis, a congenital toxoplasmosis, the patients can have a macular scar. Hmm? Also, more common is going to be myopia. In high myopia patients, when it becomes like a pathologic myopia, the patient again can present with this central macular degeneration or scarring. Last but not the least. You see a defective vision in a patient just young, uh, less than 40 years of age, okay? but you don't see any cause. You don't see any obvious lesions in the eye. Look for or think about amblyopia. A long-standing defective vision, which is right from childhood, it is a diagnosis of exclusion. So only, only after you have ruled out all these other conditions, you have to come to a diagnosis of amblyopia. There are three important reasons why a patient can become amblyopic. So amblyopia is one of those conditions where you have a normal fundus, Okay, but an abnormal vision. So the three Ds are going to be deviation, just means there's a squint or strabismic amblyopia, 
a difference in power, which means an anisometropic amblyopia. So one eye is minus two, the other eye is minus seven. There's a difference in power. So this minus seven eye becomes amblyopic. A deprivation amblyopia, presence of any any childhood lesions, like, like for example, a congenital cataract. Uh, now, now that is a problem. You have a congenital cataract, but if it goes unoperated for some time, what happens that that eye becomes amblyopic. So even after you, re you remove that cataract out, still the patient will not see much because the brain has failed to register that that eye is important or that eye is significant for the vision. So amblyopia is going to be a very important. The other name for amblyopia is going to be lazy eye, as you all know. So far, we have finished about the important causes of the gradual defective vision, which is involving more than 40 years and less than 40 years, which are painless, basically. Now, let's look at the summary maps. So to summarize again, we discussed about the two important problems when it comes to ocular symptoms. One is vision-related, other is going to be this non-vision-related. In vision-related, we discussed about the, the defective vision in detail, which was a complete focus on that. Now, I'm going to give you some algorithms, some easy to understand, easy to diagnose algorithms or, or concepts which you have to understand, which you have to remember to, to effectively diagnose and treat our patients in an emergency. So sudden onset defective vision with presence of acute red eye. Now try to recall, what are they? Acute ankylosis glaucoma, acute keratitis, acute anterior uveitis, acute endophthalmitis, and ocular trauma. In ocular trauma, we looked at the two things, chemical trauma and mechanical trauma. Sudden onset defective vision with the preceding floaters, the patients will have floaters initially, followed by a sudden onset defective vision. Think of these two. Think of vitreous hemorrhage. Think of retinal detachment, especially in a regmatinous retinal detachment where the patients can have an associated flashes as well. The other important algorithms. Defective vision in a normal ocular exam or a supposedly relatively normal fundus. Very important. Because this is a condition where neither you will see anything nor the patient will see anything. So both of you will be kind of clueless of what's happening. Okay. Amblyopia, like I said, it's a it's it's going to be a diagnosis of exclusion. So always look for amblyogenic factors. Like, like I said, those three Ds. It's a bilateral, sudden onset, painless, defective vision. Think of cortical blindness. Okay. Retrobulbar optic neuritis. When you have this pain on extraocular movement, which is sudden onset, painful, unilateral defective vision or uniocular defective vision. Think of retrobulbar optic neuritis, especially young females. Cone draw dystrophies, not sudden, could be long standing, okay? But the patients can have this, uh, they have very subtle changes on the retina. Uh, they will have history of photophobia or especially defective vision in daytime. The patient can have family stress as well. So look for cone draw dystrophy, chiasmal tumors. A patient presenting to us with a defective vision, which you don't see any lesions on the fundus, you look for any optic disc paler, which is very subtle, what you call as the segmental or a sectoral paler, which you may see a temporal paler. It's very important to identify these conditions because they are nothing but chiasmal tumor. Sometimes you have a pituitary adenoma, which is inside, which can cause slow compression of the optic chiasm leading on to this optic disc paler eventually. But initially, the patients may not present with any signs on ocular examination or on the fundus examination. In these conditions, it is important to do a field, to look for any field defect. For example, you will see this bitemporal hemianopia in patients with pituitary adenomas. So always understand, you will not see any optic disc signs in the early stages. Sudden onset defective vision and trauma, I'm just going to repeat this again. Chemical injuries, mechanical injuries, but look at this. In mechanical injuries, you have corneal tear. So what are the conditions which can cause a sudden onset defective vision when you have a mechanical trauma? Just, just think logically. The patient can have a corneal tear. They can have this corneal tear, loss of media clarity. So there can be blood in the anterior chamber called as hyphema. The patient has this lens getting dislocated back to the retina or dislocated somewhere else. Vitreous hemorrhage. Traumatic optic neuropathy. We discussed all these things, right? We discussed about lens dislocation, discussed about vitreous hemorrhage, we discussed about traumatic optic neuropathy. But there's one thing which I didn't discuss. There is this retrobulbar hemorrhage, which is an ophthalmic emergency. This is not to do with the optical media, but rather to do with the orbit. An injury to the eye can cause bleeding to happen within the orbital space, 
the orbit is like a bony space so you have blood gets trapped within the orbit therefore this becomes like this compartment syndrome so orbital compartment syndrome is very important which can lead to ischemia of the optic nerve ischemia of retina ischemia of ocular structures retinal bulbar hemorrhage is a true ophthalmic emergency you have to image the patient but even before you image the patient you have to perform emergency cantholysis and canthotomy to make sure that you relieve the intraorbital pressure this is important please don't forget retinal bulbar hemorrhage one of the important causes of defective vision in a uh, orbital trauma now let's look at the diurnal variation or this defective vision which happens in day and at night so accordingly you can split in two two conditions one is called as the at day what you call as a hamerlopia which means you have defective vision only at the day time and at night it's called as a nyctalopia we saw the conditions of nyctalopia right a nyctalopia patients can have either retinal causes or this restricted peripheral view because of this uh, dysfunction of rods it happens in vitamin a deficiency retinitis pigmentosa and other rod dystrophies congenital stationary night blindness and choroideremia these causes can cause other other retinal causes which causes this defective night vision a restricted peripheral view which means that sometimes what happens at night at night what happens you have the pupils gets dilated which means the peripheries get exposed and you need this peripheral view to to see things better at night so you have a peripheral cataract what happens that peripheral cataract comes into view at night so therefore patient will have a defective vision at night in peripheral cataracts advanced glaucoma and advanced rps and after pan retinal photocoagulation in these three conditions what happens the vision is going to get reduced the field is going to become like a tunnel vision so in a tunnel vision again what happens the patient can see only through the tunnel so at night when the peripheries getting exposed the patient cannot see much so these conditions can cause a defective night vision on the contrary what we don't often read is going to be defective vision at the day which means at the day time what happens is that the pupils become constricted so a patient is going to have a cataract especially central cataract for example a posterior polar cataract or a posterior subcapsular cataract now these are going to be at the center so at the center which means it's going to have a glare or a blurring of vision a central cataract because in day time pupils become constricted when pupils become constricted if the central part is going to be opaque or central media is not going to be clear then the patient will have this defective vision at the day time and iridia again one of the important cause iridia means absence of iris again can cause intense glare for the patient defective vision albinism is another important cause for a day like vision because of the severe glare so mind this this again is not exactly a defective vision but this can be a disturbance in vision which is going to be glare or photophobia cone dystrophy another important cause we know that uh, rods are important for the night vision so cones are important for the day vision so dystrophy of cones patients will have a defective vision in the morning time so i think we have covered all the maps the all the branches of this important core topic called as a defective vision very important topic please don't miss this topic uh, read the mind map thoroughly use this lecture as a guide for the mind map thank you so much for your excellent feedback for the previous lecture i hope to continue with many more such mind map based lectures in future thanks a lot for your patient listening take care bye